Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you'll learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secure retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in. Because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. I'm the Big Mike, Mike Zlatnik. And today it is my distinct pleasure and a privilege to welcome Clayton Morris. Hi, Clayton. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. You are a TV celebrity, current real <laughs> estate investor. Yeah, I guess celebrity is a subjective term, you know. But, but TV uh, personality, how about that? Yeah, TV Ooh. personality. I know in Russia, right, or you guys call them TV presenters, right? Uh it's all a matter of speaking. It right. all depends on, uh, but you, you've certainly been on TV and you've done a lot of uh, uh, TV programs, shows, and, and uh, you're a TV personality. Yeah, 18 years. 18 years I spent in mostly in morning television. I started out, you know, making, making no money at all, living all across the country in really small, small market television and, uh, you know, went into debt, my credit card debt. I still had student loan debt and, and then really started understanding real estate when I got to the network, got to Fox News Channel as the, you know, the number one morning show in the world on cable news. I got to started buying properties and learning the value of buying single family properties and uh, value adding to those. And uh, really in the, afford in the affordable house space is kind of my niche and then what I do at my company. And so that's what my wife and I continue to do is we have a few commercial properties. I know that's your, that's your, that's your big space. But I like, you know, the single families, the three bedroom, two bath, the three bedroom, one bath, the brick 900 to 1,000 square foot homes. They've suited me well for many, many years, and I just love them. Well, that's the American dream. That's the home. It's, it's, that is the most common product out there, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with this. In fact, that's probably a great building stone for anyone's portfolio is to invest in single family. And using the word affordable housing, uh, some people may misunderstand the concept. I think I understand it. Uh, and I, I do like the, uh, uh, an alternative term. I call it the turnkey range because most mm -hmm. people know that is a turnkey range. It's essentially, I guess, and then you, you speak, uh, just elaborate a little bit more. I'm assuming these are entry level mm -hmm. first time home buyers or investment type of property that could be rented to somebody who just wants, wants to rent instead or they just can't buy because of the bad credit, something like that. Yeah, exactly. You know, you find people think that this is uh, buying properties in, in bad areas. It's, it's not, you know, I buy in C and B class neighborhoods and, and those are the, that's the bulk of my portfolio of properties. And we rent to the nurses that work at the local hospital. We rent to the, I have a, you know, I, I, I've mentioned this person all the time, but I have a high school principal that rents, rents from us. You know, and a lot of people think, well, I, I think there's a lot of people who, and I did a podcast on this recently, and because a lot of people ask this question, they'll say, well, why wouldn't that person just buy the house instead of rent? Well, guess what? Not everyone has fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 in cash as a down payment on a property. Uh, they just don't. And so it's, and frankly, as you're seeing a lot of younger millennials, they don't want to be tied down to living permanently in a property. And if they want to stay there for two years, they don't have the down payment and they do have decent credit. They work at the local, you know, distribution center or the hospital or the local school. It's a perfect place and it's a perfect opportunity. And guess what? There's a massive, massive demand for affordable housing right now in this country. We just don't have enough of it. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. It, it is uh, affordable. Uh, it, it could certainly uh, be a great uh, home for a school teacher, a uh, school bus driver, a, a local uh, warehouse worker. And the affordability is certainly there. And uh, I know many folks who do standard, let's just call them, buy the property and rent them out. And some folks also do kind of um, rent to own programs. Have you ever done any of those? Uh, the, the reason they do it is the primary reason is, is tenants seem to take better care of the property when they feel that they sort of bought it, pseudo bought it. Yeah, I haven't done any rent to own and it's something I've been considering. Um, I know in some areas it gets a bad name because 
I think that there's a, the idea that the person perpetrating the rent to own is kind of doing it, hoping that the person doesn't work out, right? right? They move in, they give them a five or $10,000 deposit to rent to own the property, right? And then after two years, they're still not able to get their credit turned around. They're still not able to get that long-term 30-year loan. And they either have to move out or provide another $10,000 deposit. And so I think there's, there's people who I think can prey on that. Right. Um, but I, I like the people that do it with the intent. There was, a, there was a couple out of Baltimore I talked to one time, and that's their whole business. And they, they have a, a credit repair program. They really want their tenants to rent to own. They want them to succeed. So I, I appreciate that. I have not done it myself. Um, but I, you know, for the, I think these are great investments. And I really look at between, you know, an eight to 12% net return um, ROI on my properties. That's my goal on what, what I do. I try to find off market properties that I can add value to, um, you know, do that value add and then in, in good school districts and get good areas where I can have consistent cash flow where there's multiple jobs, there's expanding population, crime is dropping, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, let's just call them real estate investing 101. If you can find an opportunity with uh, some value add, some, some improvement, then you can, yeah, in order to enter in today's market, in order to enter it, uh, to get 8 12% yield, it has to be some level of a value add. If you buy it from somebody like you who acquires, does value add, and then sells, the yield is going to be lower. The market has, uh, has appreciated and the rents haven't gone up fast enough. So it's an interesting um, change in the market uh, conditions. When I was a guest on your podcast, you asked me about kind of what are the land of opportunities, what are the economic trends. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has happened over the last few years because of the appreciation of these affordable housing sort of turnkey range properties, uh, they've appreciated a whole lot faster than the rents have gone up. And the consequence is the yield, well, cash on cash has gone somewhat down. Uh, but yeah, if, if you could find a project and do uh, the rehab component of that investment, sure, makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your educational program. You have what a financial freedom. Uh, uh, financial Freedom Academy. Academy. What is that? Well, it's really the culmination of, I think, 15 years of my wife and I you know, like what you talked about on my podcast, taking action, making mistakes, learning, you know, all of figuring out our expenses, understanding a balance sheet, all of those things, getting out of debt, building, buying properties, building our net worth up. And so we put it all together. We distilled it. It's the program that I wish I had when I was, you know, maybe in my twenties or my thir early thirties. And it's the distillation of all of that. So we teach people how to overcome their limiting beliefs around money, which holds a lot of people back. Um, you can, you know, it's fine to learn the mechanics and the strategy of investing and this and that. But if you still don't believe that you are worthy of money flowing to you, it's not going to happen. So we, we talk a lot about that. That's a big component of it because I grew up personally with a lot of limiting beliefs around money. You know, money doesn't grow on trees. We can't afford that. And I'm sure it's maybe totally different than your, your background growing up in the Soviet Union. But I, you know, I, I, was, I just didn't have a good association with money growing up. I didn't feel worthy of it. And so we teach you in the program really to overcome those limiting beliefs. We also teach you to build, you know, to understand your balance sheet and to turn those liabilities that you keep, you keep on buying, turning those into performing assets. And so it's not really a real estate course. Um, but it is a really hands-on and we have a private Facebook group that my wife and I, we work one-on-one -on -one with everyone, uh, which is really great. And we do live streams to those people uh, in, the, in the Financial Freedom Academy. And it's, I think to me, it's been the most important thing that I've done since I left television is to do this, is to try to teach financial intelligence to people and, and help them. Because we were never taught this in school. I don't know if you were taught this in school, but I was never taught about building, doing this, right? I mean, this is, we weren't even, barely even taught how to balance a checkbook in high school. Yeah, thank you for sharing and, and thank you for your service uh, to folks, helping them, uh, educating them, uh, how to achieve basic financial freedom beliefs and steps and for sure I, I grew up in the Soviet Union which was in a socialist country was almost uh, forbidden to be focusing on money you're supposed to work for the good of the state and, and so on 
yes, for sure, people come over as immigrants or people who, who, who grow up here and then they just never receive financial education. It is not, not taught anywhere in school unless the parents somehow are uh, able to teach you. And, and most of these saver-like uh, teachings of your parents, uh, not to overspend, to, you know, to save, they're absolutely good concepts. And over time, uh, but they do lack investment concepts. So investments uh, as a way to achieve financial freedom uh, does require some level of, um, uh, it, it does require both psychological and mental kind of breaking through whatever fears you have. And then two, it does require basic education. Uh, so I, I, agree, I totally agree with you. Uh, and the, we don't have to go far. I go to masterminds where they educate That's even right. very well off folks like dentists. <laughs> I go to a mastermind called Freedom Founders. They educate their dentists how to invest because many of them know how to make money practicing dental art, fixing teeth, and then they, they struggle with investing because they're afraid to lose money and, and may, many of them don't know how to do it. And No, you're absolutely right about that. But we're That's talking about very well-educated folks except for they have educated in one field. And the challenge is they're not educated in the financial acumen and in the investing strategies and any of those kind of the basic finance. So. We have a lot of dentists that reach out to my company We uh, at Morris Invest. We have a lot of people that, you know, I've, I've gone out to dinner. You're absolutely right about this. Um, I was out to dinner with a couple of friends. I won't mention their names for fear of embarrassment, but um, they very intelligent doctors. One of them is a brain doctor, is a neurosurgeon. And they had a property that they were renting out for years, a multi-million dollar property. They don't live in it, uh, of course. Um, and they, they just didn't know anything. They didn't understand you know, anything about a 1031 exchange. They're thinking about selling this property. They didn't have it in an LLC. God forbid somebody gets hurt on the property. All of these things that just to, to in maybe you and I seems obvious now because we've been doing real estate investing for so long. But here's a neurosurgeon that didn't know anything about this. Uh, and it, it really is amazing to spend all of their time, you know, saving lives and doing, but they don't, they don't have the financial intelligence. And that's where I think where you and I come in and are able to help educate people. If it's an hour commute in the car to be able to listen to this. Yeah, exactly. So the brilliance of, of the example you just gave is the fact that you could have a heavily appreciated asset that doesn't cash flow well enough. And uh, if you could, you know, 1031 it into a cash flowing portfolio and suddenly, uh, you can get a ton of passive income without really doing anything other than doing an exchange and, and, and finding an alternative investment uh, asset. Right. Yeah, it was a $2 million property that is, you know, not, when you look at an ROI, it's a single family house. So the ROI is terrible, right? And so the cash flow potential for him to take that $2 million in a 1031 into you know, multiple projects or apartment complexes and other things that could actually produce real cash flow. And then of course the tax benefits, it, which would offset of course what he's making as a doctor, right? So he's making great money. Then he would be able to do a cost segregation on, the, on you know, multiple apartment complexes and basically offset everything he's making at the hospital. But again, they don't know this. That's right. That's, that's, that's the value of financial education. You're giving them both knowledge and the tools to make a difference and to change their uh, investments. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, so beyond uh, education, uh, what else you invest in? You mentioned a few commercial projects. What's been working for you? So, you know, the first two, to be honest with you, it kind of goes back to a story. I was flying to New Zealand um, when I, before I started investing, I was going there for about five days to shoot photos with a friend of mine who's a great photographer and he invited me to stay with him. So I'm on this flight to New Zealand and upon landing, I'm nearly landing and I finally got to talk into the couple, the, the couple, they were in their fifties. They were sitting next to me on the plane. And I said, they said, how long are you going to be in New Zealand? I said, five days. And I said, what about you guys? They said, oh, we're going to be here for two months. And I said, what do you do that you can go to New Zealand for two months? And he looked at me and said, oh, I'm a real estate investor. My partner and I, we, you know, we invest in single family homes. It's, that's been what we've, we've done. We, we buy them, we fix them up, we place tenants in them. And that's, so while I'm here in New Zealand, I'll just be cash flowing um, from my tenants. And so I just 
lightning, you know, shot out of my head. And I said, okay, where are you investing? And he taught me kind of his strategy where he invests in the Midwest and he looks for this, he looks for that. He doesn't fall in love with real estate. He finds the way to add value to off market properties that he can fix up. He works with great property management teams. So that's literally what I do today. I, I, I started doing that in the Midwest. I got back from that trip and I immediately started buying uh, single family homes. Um, at the time you could find foreclosures at the time you could find short sales. Now it's much more difficult, you know, for everything that we do to find these properties, but you know, 900,000 square foot, three bedroom, one bath, three bedroom, two bath house, or if I can add a second bathroom, fix it up, not over fix it up for the neighborhood and, and work, you know, I've got five year leases on a lot of my properties and work with a property management that takes great care of me. And I just consistently add to that portfolio and we help other people do the same thing. We, um, we provide a turnkey solution at my company at Morris Invest. So if someone wants a property like that, that's something we do. We work with, uh, with our IRA team as well. So walk them through that entire process of using their self-directed IRA and, and educating them on that. Um, and it, that's what has me excited. I, I, I own a few commercial properties. I have a couple you know, duplexes and six units and four unit, but my bread and butter really is the single family space. And I have, uh, I, I have, I suffer from shiny object syndrome, Mike. So, so what, you Don't know, we I do. And so, you know, you, I think what happens with a lot of people is they get started and they have that second property or the third property and it's really working for them. And then they start to swerve. They start to get shiny object syndrome and they go over here, they start looking at this and then they get off track. Um, so I think, I think you really got to get your feet wet and understand what works for you. And if it's working for you, why change course? You know, why just because you need some more excitement in your life, so for me, I, that's what I still do is single families. I love them. I grew up in a single family house. And you mentioned earlier in the show, it's a home. You know, people like to come home. They like to pull into their driveway and they don't like to necessarily have to hear through the walls other people. And they can sit down with their own backyard and, you know, and have a barbecue. And, it's, and it feels they take ownership of a home in that way. And I, that, I like that a lot. And I like that's So that's still my model to this day. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I have two questions kind of follow up. I mean, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, that's the bread and butter of uh, kind of American investing. Just it, as basic as it goes, it's a startup product. So question number one, um, management. Uh, mm-hmm. For folks invest in remote markets, my, exp- my experience has been, and I've heard this story a mil- million times. So sometimes it's great and sometimes it's so-so. I'll give you some sort of... You know, mm-hmm concerns and issues. So how do you address those issues? And when you sell a product to investors, how do you make sure that they deliver a product and you also make a good, you know, good dollar on them on the whole uh, endeavor? Right. So the question number one management, who manages your properties? Uh, and will they do good honest management? And how do you know they do good honest management and, and confident, obviously? And two, how do you deal with the fact that when you're buying a property, uh, you may have deferred issues and sometimes it's the roof and you know, it looks like it's gotten enough to last you for a few years and snowstorm comes down or something else and you, now you need a, you know, a $10,000 roof mm. and uh, it's, it can kill your cash, cash flow. So just curious. Yeah. I mean, all those things are true. I mean, I've definitely worked with property management companies and d- different markets that, that, of all different stripes. And, you know, I've, I've certainly gotten burned by contractors. I've gotten burned by property managers. We all have, and that's part of it. It's a matter of, can you move beyond that and start to really ask the right questions of a property manager? You know, how many doors are they, are they new? Are they just in business for the first year? That's probably not a property manager you want to work with. Have they been there a long time? Um, How many doors are they managing? What is their experience with increased rents over time? How do they handle that? Do they have a program for cutting the grass if a tenant doesn't cut the grass so you don't get dinged by the city for violations? Um, What about gutters and downspouts in the winter after an ice storm? Do they check that thing? So these are our questions. We work with a property manager now in our Indianapolis market that start, you know, lawn cutting program and uh, gutter repair, making sure so that you don't get a $300 fine from the city. 
you know, it's better to pay them $150 for the year for them to go out and take care of it than it is to get dinged $349 from the city. Um, so all questions, and we have great property managers that we now work with. Some are better than others. Some we've gotten frustrated with over time. Um, and then you have to make a determination. We, we had one property manager in our, uh, in our Michigan market a couple of years ago that were, there's a $200 threshold on approving a maintenance request. Well, there were a lot of $199 charges showing up on bills. And we had to have a conversation with them about it. And we moved our properties to another property management company as a result of it. Um, so some of that stuff pops up from time to time. And sometimes property managers can do a little bit of a money grab. You know, they'll, they'll send out flyers or things during the spring or winter. Hey, do you need snow removal? Do you need these extra things? And you can, I can sometimes see that as a money grab by property managers. But at the end of the day, property managers, it's a thankless business. They, they do a hard job and they don't make a lot of money uh, if they, you know, you have to have a certain number of doors and scale and making sure that they have the proper number of employees to match the scale. So they have to make money. And if, if, if providing some of those additional services keeps them in business and managing my properties, I'm a capitalist, then I want them to make money if they're taking care of my property. So that's kind of how I look at, uh, look at that. On the deferred maintenance question, you know, I'm getting an inspection on the property before I'm acquiring it to find out what really needs to be done. And if I'm going to, you know, either I'm going to tackle it then. We, we acquired a property in North Carolina not too long ago that uh, needed some deferred maintenance, but the tenant, it was all, you know, exterior. It didn't really matter much at the, at the time. And the tenant wanted to move right in, loved the property. So in five years, whenever that tenant decides to move out, then we'll tackle some of those things and uh, we'll, we'll set that money aside and make sure that we can go and take care of that property uh, when that tenant moves out. But the tenant loved it, wanted to move in. Fine. <laughs> take it. Let's go. So following that train of thought, when you uh, get your cash flow, what percentage of your cash flow? Realistic. I mean, I'm talking. I'm not looking for a pro forma number. I'm talking about a realistic number. What percent of the cash flow do you set aside as uh, repair reserves, capex? Because uh, you got one as repair reserves current. You also have capex stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the roof, the uh, anything long term, the AC, and so on. What you know. If you're making a lot of these turnkeys will generate, let's just say three, four hundred a month uh, mm -hmm. in cash flow. How much of that would you set aside for capex and future repairs? Yeah, we set aside about twenty percent um, for that. We just, you know, we'll, of all of our different properties, we'll siphon off that amount from each of our, you know, each of our LLCs and each of our companies that own the different properties in the uh, in the in the different states, and we'll put that into our. You know, into our account for yeah. just such an occasion. And then we, you know, when we have an eviction or we have a tenant turnover that requires some more work, then we'll pull it from that to go after it. But uh, we treat it differently than you would probably treat it on large scale apartment complexes, you know, um, because a lot, of, to me, that's why I like these smaller sort of bulletproof homes because there's not a lot of moving parts. There's not garage door openers, garbage disposals, air, you know, large AC units, air conditioning units, and all these types of things. You know, our tenants put window units in um, if they want to heat or cool, or excuse me, a cool the bedroom. They don't want to pay for air conditioning for the entire property, so a lot of times they want to just use window units. So I don't have to fix that. I don't fix garage door openers. <laughs> I don't fix garbage disposals. You know, there's very minimal. I try to keep the, the amenities minimal, but a nice property. So there's not a lot of big repairs. I really try to take care of the big expenses up front. You know, that's the electrical, the plumbing, the mechanicals, furnace, water heater, windows, and roof. And you take care of those things at the beginning, then I'm not having to necessarily worry about that, uh, you know, one year out of the gate. Great feedback. I, I very much appreciate your thoughts here. And uh, I think you said two things. One is uh, investment upfront. So these properties have to be well repaired, uh, mechanical systems taken care of, including the roof. And then two, the 20%. It's interesting. Uh, it is certainly a decent number. If you think about this, well, what is 20% of your cash flow? So if you 
But let's think for a minute. Um, if you have a hundred thousand dollar property and you have it leveraged with a mortgage, and ultimately it makes three hundred bucks a month. So you take sixty bucks uh, uh, every. I guess sixty. Is it twenty percent of leverage cash flow? No, I'm assuming leverage cash flow, right? You're taking twenty percent. Yeah, you- I mean, we because a lot of the properties we own, we have we don't have any leverage on. There's very few that we have leverage on. So a lot of the ones that we do are fully cash. And, uh, so it's even higher number. So if you're taking a hundred thousand dollar property, you don't have a mortgage. What are you generating per month? Seven hundred bucks. So, yeah, between if you know most of our properties, if we have a six sixty thousand dollar property, between nine hundred and like we just rented one yesterday for a thousand, a thousand bucks a month. Minus taxes, insurance, some mm-hmm. basic upkeep. So you you still make, you know, seven hundred a month, something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You take twenty percent of that, hundred forty bucks times twelve months, right? So you have you know decent repair reserves on on, on, on a property, and I agree with you. It's it's a good strategy. What's funny is you're taking twenty percent on non leveraged cash flow and you're putting it in the reserves. So you wind up with. 15, 16, 70, 100 bucks a year, right? Over in reserves. I'm mm-hmm. assuming that's that's the number. A little right. more, a little less. <clears throat> uh, what's amazing is a ton of people buy these properties and they have leverage. Not a $60,000 property, but a $100,000 property. 60000 is hard to get leverage, but on a $100,000 property. And they have a mortgage on a non leverage cash flow. They have 300 bucks a month. They need to take the same 140 bucks a month that you're setting aside, in theory, to deal with repairs. So $140 a month for the 300 cash flow, it's 40, 50%. What's amazing is people don't understand this. I, I tell them between a third to a half where the cash flow has to go in the repair fund because when a roof goes, you will have three years of cash flow gone. Right. You know, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it happens very, very quickly uh, on an, inv- you know, you don't, t- you don't anticipate it and, or you have a hurricane that sweeps through and you don't have the tr- proper type of insurance on the property. I mean, there's all sorts of variables that, you know, a windstorm that tr- knocks a tree off of a, you know, something, your shingles rip off. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong, but you've got to make sure you have those reserves in place to take care of them. Yeah. I think it's a lesson number one. Um, uh, I have a number of, of educational, um, uh, webinars recorded to talk about loss reserves and <laughs> it's a reserve loss reserve in any kind of investing. You got to have a loss reserve, whatever it is. Loss reserve could be repair problems or something else. So it's right. a, it, it is a golden rule to have that. And just, you know, from talking back and forth uh, and, and on a um, $60,000 property, you have, uh, you know, three, 4% of the value of the property per year in loss reserves, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a sizable number. Right. And, and as, as much as people want to think that they're going to get all the cash, I'm not discounting the product. I'm just trying to set a very realistic picture so that uh, when investor goes in, they go in with their eyes wide open and they expect uh, they're going to have some level of uh, those issues in the future. And if they do that, they will manage, their, their returns will be happier. <laughs> Not right. necessarily better, but happier because right. they'll, they'll know what to expect. So. Exactly, exactly. And then, you know, and then when they don't have those repairs and they're able to, you know, that money is sitting in an account, an interest bearing account, or, you know, like a Marcus savings account, or they've got it someplace where it's growing and actually generating uh, some interest while it's sitting there. Um, it's a nice reserve. It's a, it's a rainy day fund. that you, some, It's going to rain at some point. Yeah, and ideally they have a portfolio. That, that's the whole issue. When you have one property or two properties or even a small number, three or four or five, it's not enough to diversify the risk. So when one of them has a problem, it's a lot more impactful versus a, uh, an investment that's diversified across many assets. So, Exactly. So how would people find you? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Well, I think if they're interested and they love podcasts, why not just, uh, you know, I've got, it's called the Investing in Real Estate Podcast. It's a very generic name, um, but the Investing in Real Estate Podcast with Clayton Morris, um, we publish three times a week. We have experts like yourself on, Mike. Um, we do a Motivational Monday episode. Um, we also do sort of family finance. Uh, Natalie and I, my wife, joins me on Wednesday's episodes to talk about, you know, structuring your family business, how to incorporate your family, your LLC, save money, taxes with your kids, like all of those things. Um, so we do that on Wednesdays on the show. Um, or if they just want to visit our website, it's just my last name, Morris, morrisinvest.com. We've got tons of blog resources over there and and uh, and to help people just get started. My goal 
you know, whether they work with us or not, I don't care. I love hearing from people that email me or send a message on my Instagram account or whatever that say, you know, I've been listening to your show for a year and a half. My wife and I just bought our first rental property. Um, you know, I'm getting ready to, you know, buy my second one. And that's the stuff that makes me thrilled that I left the world of television in order to help people do that. So that's what, that's what excites me. That's great. I appreciate your wisdom and your sharing. Uh, and uh, thank you again. Uh, excited to be a guest on your podcast. We just exchange it. And <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to BigMikeFun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike's slot name. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.